is late, and uh, I'm going to talk about things that are going to happen almost 10 years from now. So uh, there's some data in here, but there's a lot of my speculation on what some of the new promising leads might be. Before I say anything, I just want to congratulate Vincent. I, I think, you know, we're all here at this meeting hearing wonderful advances and doing uh, uh, all we can in different ways, whatever our role is, to get novel therapies. But you know, it really doesn't mean anything unless those therapies can get to the patients who so desperately need them. And it is our responsibility, uh, Bart, <laughs> to try to do as much as we can, because all different kinds of constituencies say they're the patient advocates, but truthfully, I think we really are the patient advocates here. So with that, I'm gonna talk about the future here in my conflict of interest. And you know that we all know about MGUS from the good Dr. Kyle and Vincent. And we know that it occurs with aging. It's more common uh, in men than women. And we know a lot about it. There's been many staging systems that have been written over the years. This one by uh, Vincent uh, years ago, where the rate of progression can be predicted on the kind of protein, the amount of protein, and the kappa lambda ratio. There's other systems. But the point is we don't do anything in terms of intervening because these patients have a very low rate of progression no matter, even if they have the, the risk factors described here. But my first statement will be that we're going to find MGUS much more commonly. We're already doing it. Mass spec is being done at the uh, Mayo Clinic and it's roughly 20% of the more common than we would have appreciated otherwise. But I think by 2025, we're going to be actually screening the general population, as Irene said yesterday, not only for serum proteins, but there's going to be studies of sequencing, and they're already going on, that are going to find that clonal hematopoiesis is part of getting older. And it turns out that clonal hematopoiesis targets, uh, sorry, correlates not only with clonal diseases as we all study and treat, but in fact, inflammatory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, Alzheimer's, and others. So that over the years, what's gonna happen is these clonal abnormalities are gonna be diagnosed more and more, and diseases are gonna be diagnosed more and more, and what's exciting, I think, is preventative strategies are gonna come into being more and more. So in myeloma, the, the uh, ability now to detect these clonal cells at very, very low uh, amounts has already been uh, uh, pioneered here. This is the good Dr. Manier study, looking with uh, very low pass whole genome sequencing. Uh, Irene showed this yesterday, but showing that you can find very low numbers of clonal plasma cells in the peripheral blood. This is copy number here, increasing copy number, but you can see that they can be detected in very low levels in the peripheral blood. Uh, this is the work of uh, Dr. Trudell and colleagues up in Canada showing that, in fact, you can use cell-free DNA here to show uh, that there are uh, myeloma cells circulating. It's also true in solid tumors. You can look at different stages of myeloma uh, and find these cells. The uh, third study that just to emphasize this is from Jens Lohr at our place where again cell-free DNA was uh, studied. He's done this uh, and presented it at ASH. But the idea is that you can actually do very low pass whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing from cell-free DNA in, the, um, in myeloma. You can do it in the blood, you can do it in the bone marrow and compare them. Uh, very analogous to uh, Irene's studies yesterday, and you can actually show that at least in some cases in the blood, you have a proxy for what's going on in the bone marrow, not only the frequency of presence, but also the clonal evolution uh, that might be evident. Single cells circulating myeloma cells are, are being done. Again, Irene mentioned this yesterday, but the process here is in the upper panels, you can see circulating CD138 positive cells that are CD45 RA negative. On the bottom is the converse, so the top are the myeloma cells. And in fact, you can study those cells for gene or copy number or for translocations. And the red on the left-hand side here is actually 
showing you the abnormalities in various genes here that are more frequent in the peripheral blood than they are in the bone marrow single cell analysis. And over here from single cell analysis, you can show that there are translocations. In this case, 1114 that's present in the peripheral blood and bone marrow, and here 614 translocation present in the peripheral blood and bone marrow. So we're gonna be identifying patients who have clonal hematopoiesis and small numbers of circulating myeloma cells very, very early. So what do I think we're gonna do about it? I don't think we're gonna call it unknown significance anymore. I think we'll just call it a monoclonal gammopathy. And I think we can do immunologic things even at this very early stage. And I, I'll give you one example, which is a vaccination strategy that we're now trying to do in smoldering myeloma. I think in the next 10 years, it'll move earlier into the MGUS phase. And it is simply a peptide-based vaccine which can get uh, positive responses, and it, I believe it's going to need to be done in combination with something to augment the responses in order to get a memory anti-tumor response in people against their own clone. And I'll show you what we're doing in smoldering right now with Nikhil Munchi and others, but we're vaccinating patients with a cocktail of peptides, and proteins that are expressed on all myeloma cells in a cocktail in order to increase the frequency and extent of response. We vaccinated uh, a cohort of patients with smoldering, and we demonstrated we got immune responses that were tumor selective, tetramer positive, and type 1 cytokine positive. And in the first experiment, we added in lenalidomide and showed that we can augment these responses. But if you actually look, you can show that there are very few, if any, anti-tumor selective cells in patients, but after the vaccine, they come up in, in large frequency, as you can see here. And if you look at those cells and you ask what do they express, they express checkpoints. And the most common one in our experience is LAG3 as the checkpoint, and then it, these are preclinical studies, but if you add in antibody to LAG3, as I show right here, you can get central memory cytolytic T cells, 92% central memory cytolytic T cells in patients against their own tumor cell. So my prediction, for what it's worth, it has to be validated, is that we're gonna identify these cells very, very early, and we're gonna come in with a vaccine that can generate, like other vaccines, a memory central immune response, and in fact, if we have to revaccinate, so be it, but we may very well be able to delete the malignant clone at that time. It's not only in myeloma, these circulating cells and clonal hematopoiesis are present in solid tumors, and these same antigens are present on solid tumors, including, in fact, uh, breast cancer. We have a clinical trial ongoing in breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. The idea that you might be able to find clonal tumor cells really early and vaccinate patients at a time when they have an immune system that's a selective immune memory response, I think, is very exciting. So then um, the uh, next thing is, as you all know, Vincent uh, did with all of us in the room, revise the definition of what's myeloma and what's smoldering myeloma. And you know that there are myeloma-defining events now, even in the absence of CRAB, and you know them as a kappa lambda ratio, 100-fold uh, abnormal, or 60% plasma cells, or in, in fact, um, focal bone marrow lesions. But why I show you this is, I think in 2025, smoldering myeloma is gonna be an extinct species. And the reason it's gonna be an extinct species is, if you look at the genomic studies, the majority of patients in the smoldering category already have most of the genomic abnormalities that are present in myeloma. And you can look, and in fact, this has been done by Nikhil Munchi and Hervé and Nicole Boli and others uh, in the room, but the point is that those patients who don't have clonal evolution, they already have myeloma, have a shorter time to progression than those who actually go through a process of clonal evolution. And I have a couple of slides uh, that just point that out. This is actually studies done by uh, Nikhil and Hervé and others, looking at, in fact, patients going from a smoldering myeloma as they progress to active and then relapse disease. There's many events already present in the smoldering, newly diagnosed and relapse setting. Here are the various kinds of abnormalities that are present. 
But the point I wanted to make is that these abnormalities are present early on. This is in the smoldering phase. These are the various abnormalities in the different patients. But there are, on whatever this is here, 5,000, 6,000 abnormalities present, even in the context of smoldering multiple myeloma. And there are various kinds as shown here, translocations, deletions, et cetera. And here's the circus plot. But the point of the story is that as Hervé and Nikhil and others have followed these over time progressing, you can have in certain patients such as this one, uh, a clone here that's present both at the time of smoldering and at the time of myeloma that simply expands and becomes much more frequent, and the progression here was eight months. Over here, there's a clone that's present at the time of myeloma that wasn't present here uh, in either event. It's a new clone, and in fact, that, only pro that progression took much longer, 30 months. And so over here, that's just saying this in, a, in more patients actually, but the fact is if you have a shorter time or a longer time to progression, that has to do with more time for clonal evolution. Putting it more simply, the patients who have the clones that actually are destined to become myeloma, that occurs in a much shorter period, apparently, so we need to obviously validate this. But those patients are gonna be called myeloma, so the number that are left with smoldering myeloma, I think is going to be reduced. So once we make the diagnosis of myeloma, how are we gonna stage it in 2025? Well, we're gonna use our international staging system, because we always do that, and we're gonna to try to use targeted mutations. And again, this has been developed jointly by the French uh, and uh, Dana Farber, together with Nicole, uh, Nicole uh, Boli. But the idea is that we're gonna have a targeted sequencing, and this is probably the first iteration. There's probably better ones coming. But the point is, we are actually now utilizing a targeted sequencing approach so we can look at implicated genes that have been picked because of their biologic role in cancer. We can look for copy number up alterations and translocations in a custom target enrichment sequencing of myeloma. And it's very good, it seems. You can, you can up here, you can look at uh, overexpression or deletion of various uh, um, chromosomes here. You can find translocations. Here's some um, 11, I'm uh, sorry, 414 or CCND1 translocation here, 1114 translocation. You can see gene copy number, and here is sort of the summary. But we're going to be doing a much more sophisticated analysis than just FISH, which we're doing right now, in order to have prognostication. And this is just from their work. Again, this was just published in Leukemia, but you can see this will allow us to look at the abnormalities in terms of, for example, P53 here, and its impact on progression-free and overall survival, and you can see it's very significant, whereas some of the other abnormalities are not having significance at all. So we're going to be able to look at gene copy numbers, sequencing, and cytogenetics, and they're all going to make a contribution. But now let's say we've made the diagnosis of myeloma, and what are we going to do about it? And I agree with the distinguished pope from Spain. I think we're going to try to achieve MRD. I think Philippe left, so it's all safe. Uh, but we're going to try to achieve uh, minimal residual disease. But I want to expand on it. That's not good enough. Everybody in the room knows we can get MRD negative in our patients. But if we don't restore, in my view anyway, there's something in their immune system, they relapse, and it's really a tragedy. So I think we're going to use, a, in a newly diagnosed patient, we're going to use a four-drug regimen that's been said several times at this meeting. It's going to have the active classes, but it'll probably be the fourth-generation drug by then of an IMID and a proteasome inhibitor and a DEX and a monoclonal antibody. But then I'm going to say something a little bit controversial, which hasn't been mentioned here. We're going to then probably, if, if if it is validated, we're going to then very early in myeloma use autologous CAR T cells, or we're going to use something else which I think is even more promising, which is autologous cells that have been stimulated ex vivo with peptides that 
generate large numbers outside the patient of tumor-selective cytolytic central memory cells. And we're going to give those back as a transfusion. Or even more controversial, although I think it's coming, is an allogeneic CAR T-cell product. And I'll show you a bit of slides on each of those. And each of them, the point of this is, is they're going to be optimized for cytolytic memory cells from the patient or from a donor that are then transfused and selective. And we won't have the cytokine release syndrome and side effects that we have when we artificially activate with the T cell receptor, the CAR T cell uh, activity. So let me just show you. So everybody knows that we now transplant patients. It's been talked about three drugs. This is the French study, which I think is, is really paradigm changing. RVD with or without transplant, transplant is still very valuable and we can get MRD. But as many have said, and I said a minute ago, I think we're going to use four drugs. I think we should only do it when it's actually justified by clinical trials. We'll, time will tell. If it is not validated, I do not think we should do it. But the point is, you all know that daratumumab has been added to RVD, it's been added to KRD in this particular study that was presented at ASH by Dr. Chari, and there is a phase three trial now with KRD with or without DARA, so let's see. But if this is a positive trial, it's, and we can afford it, as Vincent just said, we will probably use it. We also have heard here beautiful talks about CAR T cells, and I'm just gonna mention this one because the two, uh, BB21 one is the one we have at our institute, but you know the CAR T-cell concept very well, where you put in a co-stimulatory molecule. The best target, apparently, is BCMA. In the preclinical studies on this slide, there is a positive result. In this dose escalation clinical trial that was presented uh, at ASH by uh, the good Dr. Berdeja, um, he actually showed that um, this achieved Remarkable results, uh, 24 patients were harvested, 21 were treated, and you heard this earlier today, but there was a very high response rate, 94%, and toxicity was manageable, although there was serious cytokine release syndrome, and there have been patients that have relapsed. So what do I think is gonna have happened by 2025? By the way, I hope I'm still here. Uh, but I think that um, CAR T cells will have been optimized or else they won't exist. And optimized to me means they're going to be able to recognize even more potently and selectively a single target. They're going to be um, optimized in terms of the kinds of cells. I think that we're going to need both CD4 and CD8, and they're going to need to be cytolytic. And I've already said repeatedly there's going to need to be a memory T cell component. And last but not least, they're going to need to persist. So I think they're going to be optimized for toxicity and given early in the disease, and I think if we do it at a lesser tumor burden, it is highly likely that we will have less cytokine release syndrome and less, therefore, toxicity. On the other side, I'm kind of excited about this, which is the idea that you can take peptides that are from antigens on patients with myeloma and ex vivo expand the patient's own T cells outside the body to these peptides, generate large numbers of cytolytic cells, and then turn, transfuse them back in. This was presented at ASH. It's not a crazy idea that's not happening. This is 15 MERS, so you get both CD4 and CD8 positive cells. It was done in AML by uh, Catherine Bollard, who's now at Children's uh, Hospital in, in Washington, D.C., and she stimulated this autologous cells from patients with three antigens, Prame, W. T1 and survive in, in, in AML, and she got six complete responses. It's extremely early. We don't have long-term follow-up, but the concept is that this was expansion of their own T cells. It costs about ten or twenty thousand dollars to make these things, and if you needed to do it more than once, you could. And in fact, as I'll show you, what we're thinking about doing in myeloma now is shown on this slide. I mentioned to you already we have a vaccine where we can vaccinate patients and we can show we can get immune response against peptides in patients. We now have a BCMA peptide that's added into the cocktail. Then what the intent would be to harvest those cells, because now the natural processing has occurred, there's been a selection for a memory T cell, and we can expand those cells outside the body with the same peptides 
ex vivo. So instead of a few percentage of cytolytic memory cells, we can get it to be hopefully the majority of cells. Transfuse those back. Again, we don't expect cytokine release syndrome because they're the natural cells that have been stimulated in the patient. And you all know that one of the problems with CAR T cells is they apparently don't persist long enough, in, at least in adults. And so I mentioned to you, we have a vaccine, as I mentioned on the bottom of this slide. So if we need to, we could vaccinate the patient at some interval to have a memory immune response persist. So I think this is a very exciting potential way. Now here is the off the wall idea, but that's what I was asked to talk about. <laughs> but, so I think in 2025, another thought is, is this one. I think it may be possible to take normal donor T cells. I know several companies who are trying to do this and we're helping them. But you can take normal donor T cells, don't even need very many of them, gene edit them so that they actually, CRISPR uh, edit them, so that they don't actually recognize now the patient as foreign and do your thing and have them target at the same time BCMA if you want, or I wrote in here two antigens, BCMA and CD138. But the idea is you could have a universal allogeneic cell that could be on the shelf frozen. And so when patients come in with their multiple myeloma, they might get induction therapy with a four drug regimen, and they'll say, oh, you know, can I have that bottle over there, the one that's uh, the BCMA and CD138, and you thaw it out and give it to them. I think it sounds like a pipe dream right now, but I actually don't think it is. And it's really, both of these concepts are, are really a, a, a variations, if you will, on CAR T cells, but really on transplantation but it's adoptive immunotherapy it, in really potentially coming home in a really important way. Now, we've already talked a lot about MRD and how we're gonna measure response in the future, and I do think there's no question that we're gonna do um, MRD, uh, and, and uh, as Hervé has shown us, and also um, Bruno, 10 to the minus six, is probably gonna be achievable uh, in the future if it isn't already. And I already have said more than once that we get MRD in terms of cancer, but it is not enough. We need to normalize the microenvironment and the host immunity, which is why I'm so excited about those, the CAR-T in the one hand, but the adoptive therapies that I just told you about have the ability to normalize the patient's host immune system. Um, and then I mentioned already that once you get the host immunity, you could potentially vaccinate. This is from Hervé's presentation at the American Society of Hematology, where in the, D, in the IFM DFCI study, he showed beautifully that 10 to the minus sixth was better than lesser depletion and also had correlation with outcome. And we've heard beautiful discussions from Jesus and Philippe about how we're gonna figure out together as a community how to use MRD. So then what happens as we follow our patients? Okay, we're gonna be following them sequentially and serially by doing genomic and epigenetic monitoring, in my opinion. And again, this is studies that have been done with Nikhil and Hervé, looking at the abnormalities that are present in the newly diagnosed patients at the first relapse, at the second relapse, and you can look at what was common uh, in that group. And when you do that, you can actually find that this will allow for more selective targeting, potentially, of those common mechanisms that might be represented in a patient or between many patients that are responsible for relapse. Now, what are we gonna have in our armamentarium or bag of tricks in 2025 that we don't have right now that will help us treat patients with myeloma? And I, somebody, many have said it here, but I sure hope that we have had a lot of progress, but that the progress really keeps, con, uh, keeps on and, until we really make a difference. The point is, we cannot let up and we need to keep pushing in many directions. I have here the genomic, ep epigenomic way, the idea that we already know together that if you modulate protein homeostasis, that's an effective therapy, and then some new immune things. So this, you all know, is the represents from Faith Davies and, and uh, Gareth the frequency with which mutations are found in multiple myeloma. Many of you in the room, Paula, um, 
Mark Rabb and others have actually done, and Bart, have actually targeted the ras map kinase pathway several ways with either one inhibitor or two inhibitors. It's been effective and it's remarkable, but not really durable, at least in most patients. You've already heard also that we're already doing venetoclax, which I think is a breakthrough, as Bart has mentioned, and others too, maybe beyond just the 1114 translocation patients, but nonetheless, uh, in the 1114, be by virtue of their BCL2 expression, there does seem to, as in CLL and lymphoma, be a selectively uh, higher response rate. But actually, in 2025, what we're going to be doing is actually looking at the left here at the DNA abnormalities in terms of copy number alterations, clonal content, et cetera. We're going to be looking at the RNA and microRNA, long RNA, and splicing abnormalities. But we're going to look at the linkage, if you will. What is regulating the genetic abnormalities? We're going to be looking at epigenetics. We're going to be looking at methylation, histone modifications, and in particular, chromatin, the way modifications in chromatin are actually impacting the genetic and the epigenetic program. So it's going to be much more broad than it ever was before, which means that we're going to be able to have more targets. And I'll show you that in a minute. So I think the other thing that's going to be happening, and Nikhil and uh, uh, Masood uh, Shamas is already doing this in our, our uh, SPORE grant, but the point is we are going to try to treat the profile of the aberrant patient, but we're also going to try to get to the hallmark processes that are abnormal in myeloma so we can maybe treat the cause rather than trying to treat the consequence. In, in our studies, the four processes that are listed here are apparently activated in multiple myeloma, especially APABEC. And so we have high throughput screens now that are being done and we have prototype inhibitors to cut down on these processes and hopefully in so doing stop potentially the constitutive and the ongoing DNA damage in, uh, that is underlying relapse. Um, I show this a lot and I do like it. You know, we're going to treat the... Uh, if we can't treat the cause, we're going to treat the abnormalities, but maybe we can treat the consequences. And this, I think, is a really example that is good in patients with MYC amplification. They have high replicative stress. They have R high ROS. And Francesca Cottini in our group actually showed that if you block the replicative stress, um, with an ATR inhibitor, or if you increase the ROS with a proteasome inhibitor or other drug, you can actually put the myeloma cells over the edge and make it too stressful for them. That's the kind of thing we can do. And I think we have what I, one of the first epigenetic therapies coming in myeloma. We're very excited about KDMs and KDM3A and others we're working on, but KDM3A has been studied. Uh, it's active in multiple myeloma. It demethylates the promoters of uh, evil genes like IRF4, for example. So if you inhibit by knockout um, KDM3, that you can restore methylation at the promoters, and you not only in, uh, decrease transcription uh, of IRF4, but as shown here, there's impact in the microenvironment. So it's not only the tumor cell, it's on homing and survival as well. In terms of the protein abnormalities and targeting them, this I've talked about before, but it's becoming real. It turns out the ubiquitin proteasome receptors up here bring the ubiquitinated protein to the proteasome for degradation. And if you block the ubiquitin proteasome receptor, in particular RPN13, you can overcome resistance to the proteasome, which is downstream in the same pathway. We have a prototype drug that neutralizes this ubiquitin proteasome receptor, and in fact, as is shown on the next slide, this actually in patients whose myeloma is resistant to bortezomib in a dose-dependent way can overcome resistance. It doesn't block the proteasome, but it does cause massive accumulation of ubiquitinated protein. We're going to have a whole new class of drugs in 2025 that we don't have, except it, we have IMIDs, but we're going to have new protein degraders. It's absolutely certain that this is happening. And it came from myeloma. And the idea is, as you all know, that the IMIDs bind the cerebellum complex. As a consequence, there is ubiquitination and there is degradation in myeloma, vicaros 1 and 3, and downstream effects. We're very excited about this concept, and there's a whole new class of drugs called degronomids 
They may be renamed. But the idea is their drugs, some of them look like Imids and some of them look totally different. They do bind to either Cerebron or they bind to two other ubiquitin-3 ligases like VHL and MDM2. They bind in different places and to be very honest with you, they're much, much more potent than the Imids. But in any event, the clever part is on the other half, you can then have binding to the substrate protein you want to degrade. So you're turning on selective degradation by giving an imid equivalent. And in fact, we have an EGFR1 that's going forward uh, with Roach now and a BTK1 going forward with Calico. There'll be hopefully some in myeloma in the relatively near future, but protein degradation. And I'll show you that what we do in the laboratory, I mentioned a minute ago the ubiquitin proteasome receptor RPN13, and we have a drug called RA190 over here. But in fact, we have a degrader of this RA190 that turns on degradation. You can see that we can degrade this. And in fact, the degrader is more potent than the inhibitor in terms of myeloma viability. Time will tell. Maybe they would be combined. And finally, just a few comments on the immune system. I think there's still more room for antibody. CD38 antibody in daratumumab has been a major breakthrough. There's another one you heard about a little bit, isotuximab. Uh, we've studied a lot in the laboratory. It has another mechanism different from daratumumab here. Whether that makes it better or worse or clinically be, uh, able to work when daratumumab doesn't remains to be seen, but the phase three trials are all done already. We have an immunotoxin coming. We don't have any of those, as you all know, in myeloma. We studied this preclinically. It's BCMA bound to the uh, aristatin immunotoxin. And in fact, it maintains its immunologic activity on the right, and it has the immunotoxin activity on the left. And it was presented by Suzanne Trudell in an oral session at ASH, and it's been given fast track designation now by the FDA because they're getting roughly 60% responses I think, yeah. In far advanced multiple myeloma with a PFS, a very early data of eight months. But it's very exciting that we don't have immunotoxins that will come. And finally, you've heard about the bites. There was a nice discussion about it earlier. They're in the clinic now. No one really knows if they're gonna be as active as some of the other immune therapies, but there is appeal because they come off the shelf and theoretically they could bring an immune response localized to the BCMA positive myeloma cells. It's been very positive in leukemia and lymphoma. So what I've tried to say is that in 2025, we're gonna be screening the population. Irene's gonna start that this year. Uh, we're going to find in that small numbers of, of, of small monoclonal proteins and small numbers of circulating monoclonal cells by either cell-free DNA and or cell, single cell sequencing. And it's going to be in the setting when there's no clinical uh, uh, sequelae at that point that would be classical MGUS. But I think we're going to have, by that time, an immune approach, and I just mentioned vaccination. It could be another one, but vaccination, I think, could be done in a preventative way as we do it to prevent infectious diseases and otherwise. I already mentioned number two here that the majority of what we call smoldering now, in my opinion, won't be called smoldering anymore because of the genomic abnormalities already present. And so we'll have a smoldering, but it will be a much smaller population of cells. I mentioned we're going to use targeted sequencing for prognostication, which will allow us to have data much more broadly than before. We're going to use combinations initially in myeloma. It's probably four agents, um, and it depends on whether the studies validate that. And then I tried to suggest some innovative things. The idea that maybe CAR T cells, if we know them now, can be revised to be more potent, to be memory cells, and to be more safe. Maybe that would justify using them earlier. But I kind of like, as I said to you, the expansion of cells, whether autologous or allogeneic, against peptides that are unique to myeloma and using those cells because you have a natural immune response under natural immune regulation, and if you need to, vaccinate to keep them going. I mentioned we're going to serially profile patients genetically and epigenetically, and that will allow us to diagnose relapse earlier and select treatment better. And then I mentioned some of the novel agents that I think, at least I hope, will be here that we can talk about this meeting in 2025. What I hope we're all going to do in this room is really on this last slide. I think we're gonna be using combination therapies. We're gonna define them in our preclinical studies. We can't possibly combine all the agents. We shouldn't. We need to do it responsibly. 
And there's going to be profiling, and we're going to be doing much smaller trials, as Vincent said. They're going to be based on profiling of patients, and they're going to be biomarker driven. We're not going to be doing phase three trials anymore. No need for it. If you have to do a phase three trial, the difference you're going to show is not significant, okay? We need to do small trials in profile the patients that are at risk with a biomarker so we can show it early or stop early. I think it's going to be collaborative efforts, and I would cite uh, Jesus here because I think it's going to be the International Myeloma Society. Jesus has led this with an, uh, incredibly with lots of outreach now in terms of educational meetings, publications, uh, lots of uh, very exciting things. The IMS is becoming a very viable organization, and I think with time, we will become really important in terms of clinical trials, doing them together in the world so that if something is found to be useful, it will be available much more broadly than it is today. And I already mentioned the bottom, which is I think if we're really going to cure myeloma, which I do think we are, we have to get MRD negativity. That means not only in the bone marrow, but ne imaging negative. <laughs> but then I think we also need to do something to get a normal immune repertoire. And I think, although there are other therapies, I really think we need to do something immunologically. And I kind of like the adoptive immunotherapy because it has the ability to restore in patients uh, their own immune response against their own tumor. And then my last slide you've all seen before, and it sort of represents this meeting. I do want to thank the organizers for letting me be part of it. But this meeting really represents the United Nations against myeloma. It's pretty awesome what this community represents. And it's no accident that each and every one of you have had a role in all of the progress that has happened. It's make science count for patients and treat patients as family. And I think those are two tenets that motivate each and every one of us each and every day. And hopefully still for me in 2025. Anyway, thanks very much.